quickly, what I want to do today is actually to provoke a discussion on uh, national security strategy. Thank you very much. So by way of my storyline, my scope, as you guys who have been in the military would say, I, I want to look quickly at the post-independence era in Africa, then look at the era that followed, that is the era of the military rule when the military guys took over, trying to suck, I mean, sucking the dictator, so to say. And then we come to the era of democratic governance, which came soon after uh, the Cold War, when uh, these uh, military governments were virtually compelled to you know, resort to military rule. Trying to create a framework Am I moving too fast? Oops, I'm sorry. OK. OK, thank you. So um, then uh, trying to remove the military guys, so to say, and uh, create democratic governance. But again, within that sector, you would see that there were some uh, shortcomings. So we will look at that quickly. And then uh, we'll look at some lessons learned. We'll look at the opportunities. And then we'll take some key messages, and that will be it. So quickly, let's look at the uh, post, the media post-independence era. What, what, what I would say is that this era was in the context of the Treaty of uh, the Peace of Westphalia. So that is the peace that created nation states. And so what we actually uh, got from independence in Africa was what Westphalia, the Peace of Westphalia provided. That is to say, you know, we had the uh, sovereignty of the state. We, we, we had the fact that, you know, we were now in an era where states were equal, equality of states. The fact that boundaries need to be supported. And uh, the fact that there was not going to be any interference, one state, in the affairs of the other. That is, the, that is actually what we got at independence. And then you can, you can see some of our leaders had, you know, gone to prison in the fight for independence. And uh, so after all these, we looked at them as very strong people. They were the fathers of the nation, the founders of the nation, and all the accolades that went, you know, with that for the Nkrumahs, for the Jomo Kenyattas, and all of them, uh, Hufe Gwanyis named them. <clears throat> it, it, their focus was uh, virtually on the sovereignty of the state, and they wanted to ensure that they had national unity and how they were going to build the nation. And they were strictly looking at the fact that they had to do all this without any interference from you know, other people or other states. They abhorred opposition because, like Nkrumah said, <laughs> opposition for opposition's sake was not going to help you know, in building the nation, and that this was a time at which we didn't just need opposition for opposition's sake, and that the nation had to be united in unison to, to, to you know, address the issues that they were to address. So because of that, there was quite some crackdown on opposition in, uh, and on the media. There was quite some media control. And you see, national security then in this context, although it was still a tool for foreign policy design, it also became a tool for dealing with you know, the opposition. So uh, in various uh, circumstances, you would say that in, those, in that era, you, you know, government used national security apparatus to deal strictly with uh, any dissent that there was and also with the opposition. We soon ended up with one party stage in a way. Now, let's, uh, yeah, so I've been talking about these and uh, saying that uh, national security then, although used for foreign policy design, was also used for domestic uh, policy design, preventing coups, because <coughs> in preventing coups and uh, dissent and all that. Let's go to the next slide. Yeah, we come to the era of the, the, the military rule. These are guys who came on to remove dictators. They were the saviors and the, the redemption guys, the revolutionary councils, you know, the redeemers and all. Their focus was in changing the, the, the dictatorship that there was. And uh, they also abhorred, you know, counter coups. And they were very authoritarian. They ruled by decree. Um, they, 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 like I said, they abhorred uh, counter coups and also, you, you know, early elections. There was quite some pressure on them after some time, after the post-Cold War era, in as much as they were being compelled to conduct early elections and uh, bring about, you know, democratic governance. So in that context, uh, national security, again, you know, as a concept, as uh, an orientation, was still being used for you know, uh, foreign policy design. 
but also, you know, for preventing domestically, for preventing counter coups and suppressing public dissent. So in this context, there was quite some uh, poor human rights abuse. <coughs> And uh, but some corruption. This was the time where you could have military tribunals trying people for various kinds of offenses, and you had people being sent to the firing squad for committing offenses, which would today just uh, you know merit some uh, custodial sentence at the <coughs> at the appropriate courts. Let's quickly look at the multi-party democratic governance. That is the context is constitutional rule. There were quite some practice fallouts. And it's important to note the ethnic and tribal you know, politics for votes that goes with that. Because then, this is about votes, how many votes you are going to get. So there was a tendency of looking at tribal and the ethnic you know, uh, groupings, which could then make you accrue the right votes you know, that you require to be able to win. There was also uh, the, the, the issue of money, the media, corruption, intimidation, or, and, and, and a correctable uh, judiciary. So that, so to say, there the, the, the was looking for every advantage that could be taken of the circumstances that democratic uh, or multi-party democracy uh, provided. One major thing was that the political parties became very strong. And uh, there was quite some impunity, and the, the political parties began to feel that they had all the power and they could do whatever they wanted to do once they had been voted for. And that the key thing was voting for them. And once they had been voted for, then they could do as they wanted. <clears throat> so political parties actually dominated the space that the local communities should actually uh, be holding. And the key focus here was uh, keeping the ruling party in power. So for national security, the orientation was towards keeping the, the ruling political party in power. So it was virtually about regime security and, and all. And it wasn't uh, people-centric. It was non-inclusive. Non so you could realize that, and it still is. So you could realize that even the legislature is not involved in whatever is national security and how to frame it. I'd like us to look at how it's been evolving. There is an evolving context. In as much as there is a public effort across the continent to, to, to now enforce the social contract that there, there is between the, the, the government and, and, and the government. So there is quite some pressure now, and it, there is quite some turbulence all across the country, all across the continent, for, 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 for changes in this kind of uh, approach of impunity by the political parties that I had spoken about earlier. So th th there are various, like the social media is being used, there are various means. In fact, there is a paradigm shift. There is a growing dominance of the challenge of the Westphalian uh, the Westphalian concept. You see, th th there is this, uh, th th that concept of non-interference and all that the Westphalian peace treaty talks about is being challenged by a neoliberal institutionalist, you know, political thinking. That neoliberalist institutional political thinking, which is talking about institutions, which is talking about sovereignty being responsibility, is now beginning to creep in and dominate the thinking of all actors in the space. And that is putting a lot of pressure on how multi-party democracy should actually be run, focusing on the social contract and all. Um, I want to continue by talking again about this paradigm shift and that there is a growing number of uh, national and international political and security uh, actors in both the political and security discourse. That human security, that, that, that there is a certain persistent call for the, the individual and the community to become, you know, the referent object of national security considerations, such, such that people are beginning to call about, uh, about whose security are we talking about, and the fact that, you know, the individual and the community, you know, should be the, the, the center of reference, and that there is an explosion for human rights, and that everybody needs to consider human rights. It's not the state, per se, by way of territory and sovereignty, but that it is the security of the people that is prime. They are calling for a certain hybrid, between the traditional national security and you know, human security, where we can now you know, have a hybrid that seeks to address how to uh, protect and empower communities and individuals. You know, the, 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 the context of globalization you know, puts this in quite you know, some other you know, uh, context by way of bringing pressure to bear on, on, uh, on governments all over Africa today. Having uh, put up this framework, I will 
quickly want to just look at some uh, lessons learned and uh, perhaps some key uh, opportunities and some key messages that we have before I'm cautioned about time. But I'd like to show just two slides that I'd like you to look at, and I'll make very little comment. I'd, I'd like us to look at an elite captured state and what it is, and perhaps begin to look at whether we, we have that in wherever we come from. That an elite captured state, you, you know, it's, it's, for, it's a political elite. And, and, and they, they are either ethnic, cultural, religious, or whatnot, and they just take the, and they're not representative in actual fact. All the voting has gone on, and they are in power, and they can say that it is democratic governance. They actually, you know, just captured the state for themselves as an elite. You know, in that case, state security focuses to repress uh, civil society demands uh, of human rights and all. And again, it's all about impunity and, you know, regime security. Keeping those guys in power, regime security. That is what national security then tends to look. Let's quickly look at an alternative. Citizen-oriented state. It normally enjoys legitimacy. And uh, I would say that local authorities are empowered and that local communities are empowered in this kind of circumstance through decentralization so that the communities and local authorities feel like part of government. And that, you know, national security seeks to integrate human security and, uh, and traditional national security. I will quickly go through my next three slides and I'll be done. Lessons learned. Well, one of the lessons I could talk about here is that national security strategy is not solely for foreign policy design and that it's also a tool for domestic policy design. That it should be, you know, a whole of society approach. It should be given a whole of society approach instead of just sitting down in an office somewhere at the national security headquarters and drawing out a plan and saying that that is our national security strategy. I would say, when I used to be national security coordinator for Ghana, we did a drafting, I led a team that did the drafting of a national security strategy for Ghana. But the point is that you as a technical person, you can only do the drafting and present it to the political authorities who will approve it. We sent a copy to parliament, we sent a copy to the parliamentary committee for uh, subcommittee for intelligence and, uh, and uh, interior, and they were looking at it. They never got it approved. So Ghana, as at the time I was national security coordinator, never got a national security strategy out because the draft was never approved. Now, there was a situation where uh, my, com my, my compatriot, the minister for uh, defense, uh, sat down with his guys in his office and, and wrote something that was called a national uh, defense strategy. And uh, I, I don't know, without consultation even with the other members of the National Security Council, which, uh, of which I was a, a critical member, you, you know, he managed to get the president to sign the document. And they were floating it around that that is a national, national defense uh, strategy. And I always pointed out to them that that thing had no legitimacy. And that Ghana as it is, a boy in the street will go to court one day and throw that thing out of the window because it has no legitimate basis. The parliament knew nothing about it. It was just one individual. Let's leave that. Let's go on with the lessons. Um, so I'm saying that in this kind of uh, situation, you know, regime, when you have regime security, it undermines government legitimacy in the first place. Let's go quickly to the opportunities. Well, uh, still, uh, yeah, th th this lesson is important. Let, 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 me, let, let me look at that one. Where we are talking about the fact that when political parties become so strong, particularly in the local communities, they create a situation of us versus them which really is at the bottom of all the difficulties that we have been having. Because the traditional local communities have been destroyed and taken over by the political parties. They completely occupy the space of the local communities. And everybody is now identifying himself as one political party or a member of one political party or another, and flaunting that in the face of the other guy, particularly when he is in government. And that creates a lot of tension. And that, that is a lesson that we need to learn. And that we need to empower the community and bring back our traditional communities and not change the communities, which we have all known, into political party communities. Because that is creating a lot, lot, lot of problems. I want to look at the opportunities. I'm saying that uh, 
we, we have an opportunity in, in your national security strategy planning and whatnot, you have an opportunity to, to use it as a tool to enhance mutual trust between the state and the citizenry. And it is an opportunity that you need to take advantage of. Uh, I did something wrong, huh? <coughs> Good, let me just press on for time. <coughs> so I'm saying that you, you, you need also, you can use that to create good working relations. Because you see, in your national security strategy planning, you, you cannot sit alone in your office and do it. I'm saying that it's a whole of society, whole of cross-sectorial matters. So if you are better off having good relations with the Minister of Finance and talking to him about what your national security anxieties are and getting him to put those things into the national budget, you are better off talking to the Minister for Water and getting him to put your anxieties into his budget so that the funding is done. Instead of you sitting down and thinking that you would want to write something and hope that it will be taken, it's not everybody who takes national security seriously. At least I have realized that from my experience as national security coordinator for Ghana. It's not everybody who is, taking, who is giving national security that priority that you think it should be given. They are giving priority to other things. So a whole of society, a whole of government thing, you need to liaise with all the other sectors. Good. Now, I'm talking about the fact that it should be participatory uh, and uh, that we will need to make decentralization and empowerment of local communities important. And that we need to take advantage of that. And also that we need to use social media. I wonder how many of you have social uh, so, uh, Facebook accounts, for instance, which is known to the public, the general public. That, ah, this is our head of security, national security, and he has this Facebook page, and I can go there and I can tell him what I want to tell him, and that he will reply me. That is important. That is where we are today. We are not in the, in the situation of yesteryear. The, the secrecy and whatnot that was used some time ago, that myth is broken. So it is important to, to, to begin to present yourself, you know, in this uh, space. Let me now just look at the key messages, and I will sit down. Yeah, so I have some key messages here that, you know, we, we need to work on state citizens' relations. That national security is a cross cutting tool for both domestic and foreign design, uh, policy design. And that we should involve all stakeholders, right from government through to the local communities, with the aim of building trust and good government citizen relations. That is important. Another uh, key message I have here is that we'll have to look at the human vulnerabilities. Because bringing the human, beings, the, 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 the human beings and the community into the center of national security consideration, we should be looking at the human vulnerabilities and finding ways of reducing these vulnerabilities. And I'm saying that reducing these vulnerabilities and looking at them within the context of building trust and within the context of the rule of law could be the best pathway of enhancing state security itself. Now, I'm, I'm also saying that, you see, uh, it is important once you are at the national security level, to begin to focus on having the capacity that gives you rapid intervention, so that when something has happened, you are able to quickly mobilize to, to rapidly intervene, and then you can be seen as national security. And it's very important. I'll give you a small example. In Ghana, what I did when I was national security coordinator was that I had a, I had a, I had a borehole drilling machine, which I, I, we purchased. Why did I purchase that? Every time there was some you know, newspaper item that made a lot of noise. Uh, you know, school children don't have water. There is this hospital, they don't have water. This community and cows are drinking water. I said, okay, we'll solve this problem. So we bought a machine and we kept it at our place. Anytime I saw in the newspaper that they said cows are drinking water, I dispatched the machine there and they drilled the borehole for them. Very soon everybody kept quiet. I'm saying that as national security, you need to think outside the box and, and, and create that capacity where you can make an impact to be respected as national security. And uh, I will want to end by making reference to a statement that President uh, Mills made when he was president. I worked under President Mills. And President Mills, you know, used to say that, no, please. President Mills used to say that the only reason we are in power, and he used to repeat it, that the only reason we are in power is to improve the living standards of the people. So if, as national security, this is our orientation. Then we are not going to have a, a situation, we are not going to have a situation where guys who are marching on May Day will say that when 
the poor run out of food, they will eat the politicians. Thank you very much. <laughs>